U.S. Naval War College is a Navy's home of thought. Established in 1884, NWC has become the center of naval sea power, both strategically and intellectually. The following issues in National Security Lecture is specifically designed to offer scholarly lectures to all participants. We hope you enjoy this upcoming discussion and future lectures. Good afternoon and welcome to our final Issues in National Security Lecture for this academic year. I'm John Jackson and I will serve as host for today's event. We extend a special welcome to Rear Admiral Pete Garvin and his lovely wife Cheryl, both who have been very supportive of this series all year. I'd like to note that we're gathered here together in person. We also have a large audience dialed in via Zoom. Over the 2023-24 academic year, we've offered nine lectures from some of the best scholars in the world, our resident faculty. We had originally intended to present 10 lectures, but weather and scheduling issues caused us to trim the schedule slightly. These lectures were intended to share a portion of the Naval War College's academic experience with the spouses and significant others of our student body, as well as the entire Naval War College extended family, including members of the Naval War College Foundation, international sponsors, civilian employees, colleagues throughout Naval Station Newport, and others around the globe. We have had participation here in the audience via Zoom and by watching lectures when they're posted on YouTube. We have promised to provide certificates of participation to all viewers who have seen 70% of the sessions offered. Next slide, please. On this slide, you can see what you must do if you want a certificate. Please send an email with the following information. A statement that you have completed six or more lectures during this series a listing of the lectures you've attended and the method you used in person via Zoom or via YouTube, the exact spelling of the name you desire on the certificate, and a mailing address, yes, a snail mail mailing address, so that we can send you hard copy certificates. And my uh, email is up there, as you can see, and it's also in the uh, events that we put out announcing these uh, sessions and whatnot. I ask that if you're gonna ask for a certificate, you let me know by the 15th of June because we have some preparation time and uh, we need to have a cutoff date so we can get those going, so. Okay, on with the main event. At the conclusion of the presentation that follows, we will welcome questions from our in-person audience. And we ask that you use the microphones located at each seat so all of us, including our virtual participants, can hear the question. Our virtual participants should feel free to ask questions using the chat feature of Zoom, and we'll get to as many of them as possible. So let's move on to the main part of today's lecture. In just two weeks, the world will pause to recognize the 80th anniversary of one of the most momentous events in military history, Operation Overlord, the amphibious invasion of Northern France at Normandy on 6 June 1944, commonly known as D-Day. This opened a second front against Nazi Germany and Northern Europe, followed by the Battle of Normandy, the liberation of France, and the invasion of Germany from the West it led to the eventual collapse of Germany. This afternoon, Professor Carpenter will examine the strategic and operational planning for the invasion, and he will highlight many of the most significant events of what has been called the longest day. Dr. Stanley D. M. Carpenter is Emeritus Professor of Strategy and Policy here at the Naval War College. He retired in 2020 after 22 years on the faculty, having served in various positions, including as strategy and policy department head in the College of Distance Education. He holds a PhD in British history from Florida State University, a master's in Scottish history from the University of St. Andrews, and an AB with honors in history from the University of North Carolina. He retired from the U.S. Navy in June of 2009 with the rank of captain, having served three commanding officer tours and several senior staff positions. He is also the author of several historical fiction action adventure novels. If you want to come up afterwards, he'll tell you how you can get them. Please welcome a friend and a former colleague in CDE, Dr. Stan Carpenter. Okay. 
Thank you, Professor Jackson. So I'm going to turn this away since I'm mic'd up. Uh, let me say that uh, it is a privilege and an honor to be back here on the stage at Spruance Auditorium. It's been about five or six years at least. So let me launch off with what is commonly called D-Day. Now, for those that are not familiar with military terminology, D-Day is just simply the designation for uh, the day of an amphibious landing. H hour is the actual moment that the troops go into the beach. Um, however, in terms of the history and the, the lore, if you will, of this amphibious landing on the 6th of June, 1944, it's just simply called D-Day, known as D-Day. The actual operation, uh, including the planning, the movement to the beach, the actual landing of the troops, uh, and securing the beaches, securing a lodgement, was known as Operation Neptune. So looking at my slide here, I probably should have changed that to Operation Neptune, because that's really what I'm going to, to talk about today. Um, and by the way, I want to say I want to welcome everybody on Zoom. Uh, wish you could be here, but uh, hopefully uh, you know, you'll be able to, to get a little bit of knowledge about Operation Neptune and D-Day from uh, from your Zoom presentation, or I think uh, on YouTube it also is going to appear. Well, a little bit of background. What was the strategic situation as we're approaching 1944? In 1943, there was a lot of pressure from the Soviet Union uh, to open a second front. And the Allies, so we're really talking here, the United Kingdom, the United States, and Canada, although there was participation in all these events by free French units, uh, Poles, Czechs, a uh, whole conglomeration of allies, but the major ones are going to be the United States, the United Kingdom, and uh, in Canada. So there was a lot of pressure to uh, come back onto the continent of Europe and to essentially defeat Germany. Uh, the British were primarily pushing for the Mediterranean, as you're going to see here shortly when I show you a map. Uh, whereas the American high command, that would have been Admiral King, uh, General Marshall, they were really pushing for gaining a lodgment in northern France and then pushing directly into Germany. So there was a lot of tension between the Allies going back and forth. Well, they finally settled uh, on an overall plan at what was known as the Quadrant Conference in the spring of 1943. And that was actually held at Quebec. Uh, a, a number of decisions were made there, but specifically for what I'm talking about today, the decision was made to launch an amphibious assault on northern France in May of 1944. So they had roughly a year to prepare for this. Let me um, see if this works and we'll go to the next slide. I apologize, I'd love to be able to use the laser pointer uh, to point out things, but it doesn't work on this type of screen. So I'll do my best to, to, to uh, point you to the highlights here. There is the situation, 1942, to the time we get to Operation Overlord. Overlord was essentially the encompassing all, the landing on the beaches, or movement to the beaches, and then moving inland, and then the battle, really, of Normandy. But there were some precedents here. Operation Torch, if you look down, you see Morocco and Algeria, December, November, December time frame of 1942. That was valuable because it allowed the Allies to literally open another front against the Germans. Now, the British had been fighting uh, since 1940 in North Africa. And by this time, the British Eighth Army had won the Battle of El Alamein, and was pushing the Germans westerly. So the idea here is a, basically a pincer movement uh, with the Americans landing in those three areas you see there, Oran, Algiers, and Casablanca, and essentially squeezing uh, the Germans into Tunisia and ultimately by the late spring of 1943, forcing the Germans to surrender. What that did, particularly for American troops, this was their first real combat action for the US Army. It gave them practice in amphibious planning, amphibious operations, actually hitting the beach, consolidating your forces, 
regaining your military power. You're going literally from zero military power when those ramps come down the landing craft to up to 100% uh, uh, military power. And you've got to do that very quickly as you move inland. So Operation Torch gave uh, the American troops, the green, raw American troops, a lot of combat experience, as did the whole North Africa campaign. Um, then came two more operations, landing in Sicily, Operation Husky, and eventually landing in Italy, you see there. Uh, avalanche was one, shingle was another. The idea was to inject more combat power and hopefully knock the Italians out of the war. The Italians were one of the members of the Axis Alliance. Here's where it got a little shaky or a little tense in terms of the two nations because the United States wanted to come into northern France. The British wanted to focus more on Italy and the, and the Mediterranean. Now, what the, the, one of the compromises that eventually occurred was Operation, originally it was called Anvil, then it was known as Dragoon, in August of 44. Again, the idea is you've got Allied troops pushing in from the north of France, and then eventually, two months later, uh, pushing in from the south. Uh, so that's essentially the, the major landings there. And again, the, the idea I'm trying to get across here is it gave them a lot of experience before you ever embarked on Operation Neptune Overlord in terms of amphibious uh, landing. A lot of experience. What about the German side? There is Herr Feldmarschall Gerd von Rundstedt. He was the overall commander uh, in France, uh, and he believed that the way to defeat any Allied invasion was to keep your troops in re reserve until the Allies made their move and then rush in the reinforcements and drive them out. Now, he was basing this all on the Führer Directive 51, which basically uh, established the defense of France anticipating uh, an amphibious landing in 1944. Well, there is a second officer, Feldmarshal Erwin Rommel. Uh, you probably have heard of him, the, the Desert Fox. Now, he had actually left North Africa as commander before the total collapse of German troops in uh, Tunisia. Uh, for health reasons, but he was appointed as commander of uh, Army Group B, which was the German formation that was to defend that Channel Coast. His idea was different. He said, when the invasion comes, we must meet them on the beaches. We cannot allow them to make a lodgment uh, and then start moving in reinforcements. We must drive them off the beaches immediately. So you have this incoherence between the two major command figures. Well, what ultimately happened was Der Führer, Adolf Hitler, essentially made the decision to go with Rundstedt's plan and to hold them in uh, reserve, several uh, panzer divisions in reserve. That's going to cost the Germans quite a bit. If they'd gone with Rommel's plan, it might have been a more dicey operation. So beginning uh, in the uh, early 1940s, uh, 1942 specifically, Germany began building what was known as the Atlantic Wall. And you can see there the green line goes all the way from the North Cape of Norway all the way down to the coast of Spain, uh, the border with Spain. Now, Spain was technically neutral. And the idea was to completely fortify that so that anywhere that the Allies choose to land, whether it be Norway or France or the Netherlands, they were going to meet with something like that. So it was, the Atlantic Wall was not only gun emplacements, that's a fairly large caliber. I'm not sure quite what it is, but I would guess maybe 11 or 12 inch gun for those that are familiar with those. Uh, but more often than not, they would be concrete pillboxes, gun emplacements. Uh, and in fact, if anybody ever goes on, oh, say, a Viking Ocean cruise, uh, to the Baltic and you go to Denmark, uh, they will actually take you up to some of these fortifications. The reason why they are still there is because after the war, the Danish Navy took over them and used them as an operating base and then turned them over to a historical association. So they are basically museum pieces uh, in, in Norway as well as Denmark. You can actually still see um, uh, parts of the Atlantic Wall. So the idea was to defend everywhere. Now, there's an old axiom in military affairs. He who defends all 
defends none. And that's going to be uh, the, the conundrum, really, for Germany is where are the Allies going to land? Uh, their best guess was the Pas de Calais, uh, which is that, that along the French coast, it's literally about 20 miles across from Dover. And if you stand on the white cliffs of Dover on a very clear day like today, you can actually see the coast of France. So that seemed to be the obvious place where the Allies were going to land. Well, they didn't. There is the Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, or SHAFE. Those are the major commanders of this operation as it's beginning to be planned and unfold. So let me introduce them. Of course, in the middle, everybody, I hope, recognizes uh, General Eisenhower, who in January 44 was appointed as the overall uh, commander of SHAFE. Uh, he had been the commander in Torch, and, uh, in Husky, and also uh, in Italy. So he was well-versed in terms of capability. I'll talk a little bit more about him in a moment. So to his right, that's uh, Air Chief Marshal of the Royal Air Force, uh, Tedder. He's going to command the Air Forces. Uh, then to, uh, sorry, that's to, to Eisenhower's right. To Eisenhower's left, that's the famous Monty. Uh, later Field Marshal, but at this time General uh, Bernard Law Montgomery. Behind Montgomery is General Walter B. Smith, known as Beetle, to all his comrades. Next to him, there is the um, uh, Air Chief Marshal uh, Lee Mallory. Sorry, I misspoke. Tedder was the deputy. Um, Lee Mallory there, behind uh, Eisenhower and Montgomery, was head of all the Allied Air Forces. And then next to him there, the Navy Admiral, that is Bertram Ramsey. Uh, those of you who have seen the movie Dunkirk, you will have seen that character introduced. He was the flag officer that basically organized and ran Operation Dynamo, which was the evacuation of over 300,000 British and French troops from Dunkirk in 1940. So that's Ramsey. Next to him, I'm not positive, I believe though, that's Omar Bradley. And he's going to command the, uh, the First Army, which is one of the two uh, army groups that's going to land. Well, what about Eisenhower? There he is uh, later as a, as a five star, uh, but he was a four star at the time. Really had never had a battlefield command. He was not an operational commander as such. What he was brilliant at was planning and particularly diplomacy. Uh, you had to have someone that could hold all these disparate interests together and working in unison toward a common goal. Uh, we call that unity of command, unity of effort. It's critical. You see, the Germans don't have that. They have two major commanders with different operational concepts. Well, with the Allies, you had uh, Eisenhower, who was the superb diplomat and could hold together this really vast coalition of, of Allies. Some other characters, uh, Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery. Uh, he actually was promoted to Field Marshal in September, because he was going to be a general at the time. He was the victor of El Alamein, and he probably was the most popular, maybe even influential of all the uh, British uh, senior officers at the time. Monty, a little hard to work with. Those of you who've seen the movie Patton, which I dare say is probably 90% of you out there, uh, they did a nice representation of that conflict between Montgomery and, uh, and George Patton. Well, he was that way with everybody. Uh, the American officers accused Montgomery of being too slow, too cautious, too deliberate. He really was an organizer, and he wanted everything to be in place perfectly before he took action. I think what was really driving a lot of that was the fact that by 1944, Britain had been in this war for five years, and look at the horrendous casualties. So whereas the Americans were enthusiastic, vigorous, let's go get them, uh, the British were a lot more cautious because they had suffered a lot of casualties. So I think Montgomery, for all his other faults, I don't think he can be blamed for being somewhat cautious and casualty averse. Well, there's everybody's favorite general, uh, George S. Patton. Uh, another one that you might, in fact, in, in the movie, he even the, referred to himself as a prima donna. <laughs> uh, and uh, and the, it was a great line. He said, the thing I hate most about Monty is he's a prima donna, but he won't admit it. Um, so 
George S. Patton. Well, uh, most of you probably know the unfortunate story of General Patton. He was a uh, U.S. Army commander in Sicily, Operation Husky, and he was visiting a field hospital, and there was a soldier uh, that what we would call today PTSD. Uh, back then, uh, it was known as combat fatigue. In the First World War, it would be known as shell shock. It's a dynamic that has existed in military affairs since the beginning, uh, but it's basically a psychosis. And so Patton, mm -mm, he wasn't going to have any of that. So he literally slapped the... the the head, or the, maybe with the helmet, we're not sure, uh, of this soldier, and it blew him into a huge public relations uh, problem. Uh, Patton was known to, to run his mouth, quite frankly, and he was not very politic. So by the time of this uh, planning for D-Day, uh, the Germans, of course, expected Patton to command all the land troops because they saw him as the most skilled of all the Allied senior commanders. Uh, but Patton was in the doghouse uh, because of the politics of the, of the whole thing and the public perception. But they did something very interesting in Knowing full well that the Germans expected Patton to command the invasion, they created a totally fictitious army group called First U.S. Army Group, or FUSAG. Now, these couple of interesting pictures, this is proof positive that soldiers in the 1940s were far stronger than they are today. Those are rubber. Those are, yes, they're made of rubber. I think the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company made most of them. Uh, the idea was to create this totally fictitious army group based in eastern England, southeastern England, uh, and let the Germans think that that's going to be the major strike force, and naturally enough, they're going to strike it de Calais. Uh, there were a number of ways to transmit this. There, there were a number of double agents and, and spies that the Germans thought were on their side who were actually British agents. And they were transmitting this information to Berlin, building up this idea that FUSAG under Patton will be the major strike force and they're going to land at the Pas de Calais. They even backed this up with air power. Uh, they had a strategy called the transportation plan or the transportation strategy. And the idea was to use air power to destroy all the transportation network in France, bridges, roads, railways, particularly rail uh, terminals. And the idea was to, once the invasion occurred, this would slow down the Germans uh, being able to, to reinforce and move troops and logistics into the battle zone transportation plan. And just to back this up, two-thirds of all the missions, the, the bombing sorties, were conducted against the Pas de Calais area and only a third in the Normandy area. So literally from the time the invasion happened for several weeks, Adolf Hitler, and I'm sure others in the German high command, believed that up oh, Normandy, it's just a diversion. The real invasion is going to be under Patton. They're going to come from Southeast England, and they're going to land at the Pas de Calais. Uh, that basically froze in place a number of panzer divisions uh, that were kept in reserve for several weeks that might have made a big difference in terms of keeping the Allies, maybe not pushing them off the beach, but certainly keeping them contained. Now, I want to diverge here just for a moment and, and talk about a panzer division. A uh, German officer by the name of Guderian, Heinz Guderian, put this concept together in the mid-1930s. And interestingly enough, the Panzer Division was based on the old Roman Legion. The idea being that it's like a Swiss Army knife. The division has all the tools to be able to fight independently. And so in a Panzer Division, not only would you have the armor, the tanks, but you would have the mechanized infantry, the guys that ride in the uh, in the trucks and the, uh, the half tracks, if you, if you will. Uh, they follow the, the tanks. Then you've got the foot infantry. But it's called combined arms. And the idea is you, you coordinate with the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, tactical air force, um, for close air support, for air strikes. But within this division, you also got all your supply functions, all your communications, command and control functions. You've got engineering. You've got um, artillery. So in other words, a self-contained unit of all these elements of military power. That basically was what the Panzer Division looked like. 
Well, it worked so well in Poland in 1939 and in France in 1940 that the U.S. very quickly adopted that. So if you look at a U.S. armored division by late in the war, it looks pretty much just like a, uh, a uh, German panzer division. Uh, all right, so even to the point of rubber tanks, and they would uh, set up field operations, just empty tents one after another. Uh, it's actually quite successful. If you are a fan of um, Ken Follett, for example, I think it was his first successful novel, maybe a second, called Eye of the Needle. Came out in the 1970s. And the basic plot there, I won't tell you what happened, but the basic plot was this German agent in England called Dinidal, or The Needle, actually discovered or figured out that Fusag was fake. I'm not going to tell you anymore. You've got to get the book. Um, one of Ken Follett's best. All right, there's General Omar Bradley. He commanded the, the, the U.S., basically, First Army. Uh, British General Miles Dempsey commanded the Second Army. So you've got these two large army, army groups uh, uh, that are going to be landing. Okay, so why Normandy? Why Normandy? Well, uh, several reasons. Four I can really think of that really shine out. Number one, um, because it was so far away from German airfields in, say, Holland, Belgium, and further into France, the further away you can get from them, the less loiter time aircraft have over the combat area. As a matter of fact, uh, only two German fighters flew over the Normandy beaches on that day. That's how decimated they were. But the idea was to get far away from, from the Luftwaffe. Uh, another reason uh, for Normandy is you could now bring in uh, air assets, bombers, fighters, what have you, from further west in England uh, because they could come straight across the channel. Whereas if you were going for the Pas de Calais, um, those in, say, uh, based in western, uh, the west country, might have the same problem the Luftwaffe would have in terms of, of loiter time over the battle space. So there's a couple reasons with air power. Uh, another reason is it was an unlikely place to land troops. Not so much for the beaches, but Omaha Beach especially. And I'll talk uh, specifically to Omaha Beach here shortly. So the idea was uh, in there's no way the Allies are going to land there because it's just too heavily defended and it's got some interesting geography. So that was all part of thinking the Germans are going to land at the, the obvious place coming across uh, the Pas de Calais. Well, there is Major General Sir Percy Hobart, bit of an iconoclast. Uh, he actually was fired from the army in 1940. Uh, he was a brother-in-law of Monty. So you can imagine when these two guys got together, must have been an interesting family party. He was also an innovator. He was one of these mad scientist types, as you're going to see. Well, Churchill uh, restored him to uh, active duty in 1943, and they created the 79th Experimental Armored Division of the Royal Engineers. And the idea was to, to create unusual weapons, primarily to make it easier to get across the beach uh, and to, uh, to inject uh, tank power onto the beach. So here's some examples. They were known as Hobart's Follies or Hobart's Funnies. You hear them referred to both. So let me show you some of them. Uh, I'll start in the upper on my right. Uh, that's a Churchill tank, basically fixed with a flamethrower. And if you see the front of it there, you see that little box thing down. They took the machine gun out and made it a flamethrower. And this tank would haul a, a, a trailer carrying all this uh, gasoline. Uh, so a flamethrowing tank. Now, down below, you have what was known as a duplex drive. They took Sherman tanks, hooked up the gearing, and put two propellers on the back of it. And then that's a canvas. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you call it, canvas bag, yeah, close enough. Uh, and the idea is when they uh, were about to roll off the, the landing craft into the water, they would have this canvas bag deployed and it literally would motor on in to the beach. And there you see it uh, down. I will talk more about the problem with the duplex drive 
particularly on Omaha Beach. Well, some more, starting at the, to my right, the, the lower. Uh, that was um, known as the bobbin. And the idea, this was a canvas reinforced with the steel rods that you lay down in front uh, so as to create a, a more firm pathway than just the sand. Coming across, that's known as a flail tank. If you look in the front, those are chains hanging down that would literally go around and hopefully ignite, set off any mines down below um, and create a, a mine-free pathway. Then you had the fascine. You see that? That's a bunch of sticks uh, that are reinforced and put together and you drop it in and, and it basically covers over any ditch or um, uh, a crater of some type so that the, the troops can follow. Uh, and finally, you have that thing, <laughs> uh, and that is a, will fire a 40-pound high-explosive round. It's almost like a, a mortar, and the idea is to land that on top of a German concrete bunker. So Hobart's Funnies or Hobart's Follies. Uh, they work relatively well, except for the duplex drive tanks, which I'll talk about a little bit later. All right, so what kind of problems are you facing? Well, first off, you have to disguise the movement. Then you have to collect together over 6,000 vessels of all kinds. And they're actually going to rendezvous. You, you can actually see the point there just south of, of um, the Isle of Wight. You see where all those lines are coming together and on to the, to the beach. That was known as Area Zebra, or as the Brits would say, Zebra. It was also known as Piccadilly Circus. Because any, yeah, anybody that's been to London and walked through Piccadilly Circus, you know it is a circus. It's a beautiful place, but it's constant traffic crowded. So that's what the troops started calling Operation or uh, Area Zebra. So then the movement uh, at night onto the beach, the um, first thing that would happen here is the minesweepers went in and cleared two channels in each beach, the five beaches, I'll show you those shortly. One channel was known as the fast channel. This is where your destroyers, your PT boats, your fast craft would go in and out. A second one was the slow channel, and this is where your landing craft would be. So um, 10 different channels uh, cleared mines going in. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, what you have to do very quickly once the troops go onto the beach is you have to come up to full combat power very rapidly. And you're coming up against a defended beach. So this is not easy to do. You also have to disguise what you're doing. Uh, what if, say, a German submarine surfaced right in the middle of this 6,000 ship convoy and reported it? So operational security was very, very important. All right, so Operation Neptune, there you see the five beaches. Sword and gold, British troops landing. Juneau, Canadian 3rd Division landing. Omaha Beach and Utah Beach. Um, and I want you to note uh, Cherbourg there. You can see that up on the, uh, the peninsula there. So Operation Neptune. Here were the units that hit the beaches. On Omaha Beach, it was elements of the US 29th Division and the US 1st Division. Now the 1st Division, they were veterans. They had been fighting uh, in the Mediterranean. So they were extremely well rehearsed and, and technically up to speed. 29th Division, this was their first combat. Uh, they were based uh, initially on the Maryland and DC and Virginia National Guard, federalized in 1941. Um, so they are going to be less experienced. On Utah Beach, you've got elements of the 4th Division, which again had a lot of combat experience in the Mediterranean, and the 90th Division. Um, in the interior, the idea was to land airborne troops. Uh, as you're looking at the coast of Normandy, to the right you landed U.S. Airborne 101st and 82nd Airborne Divisions the night uh, before the, the landing. The idea there was to try to cut off or delay German reinforcement movements coming in. Uh, on the, on the left-hand side, where the British Canadian beaches were, that was the British 6th Airborne Division. So those are the units that are going to be involved. Uh, 
I probably should have done a different slide here. This is what Normandy Beach looked like once you had a lodgement. Um, supply was a huge, huge problem. Getting all these ships to the beach offloaded and back away. But that's what uh, Omaha Beach would have looked like a few days after the initial landing. Once the decision was made to go, um, the afternoon of the 5th of June, uh, Eisenhower actually went out and visited the paratroopers. There you see 101st Airborne. Uh, a lot of you have seen Band of Brothers, which is, a, I think, a brilliant production focusing on Easy Company of the uh, 101st. Uh, that's a famous picture as he went out and visited the troops, fully expecting that casualty rate on D-Day for these guys would be 70, 70 percent. So, how did this evolve? Now we're down to the 4th of June. And the problem is the, the weather guessers, sorry, apologies to any of you meteorologists, the weather guys, uh, headed up by uh, Royal Air Force Group Captain James Stagg, uh, they saw that the weather, it's going to be bad. Uh, it, in fact, uh, he referred to it as, sir, the weather will be evil. Uh, and so even though all the troops were being loaded on board, D-Day was initially going to be the 5th of June, they decided we've got to delay 24 hours. Beyond that, you had to wait for the tides and everything to be just right later in June, uh, but you always ran, run the risk in the English Channel of pretty bad weather. So it was an onerous decision. Uh, so the evening of um, the... Uh, uh, the 4th of June, meeting of all the, the shave heads and whatever, uh, we can't go. Delay 24 hours. Uh, they met again the next day, and uh, Group Captain Stagg came into the room with a broad smile. And he said, it looks like the weather over the channel and over the landing beaches will be okay for a few days. So Eisenhower, he got up, he walked around the room after he had polled all the other officers who said, go, go, go. Eisenhower looked up and said, okay, we'll go. Three of the most momentous words ever spoken in the history of the world. That, by the way, was their, their headquarters there, Suffolk House, uh, which is an old um, uh, country estate. One of the other aspects of preparation for and action on D-Day was using the French resistance. And the idea here was to uh, have these groups come out in force, uh, disrupt German communications, blow up telephone lines, telephone poles, uh, plant explosives to blow up uh, uh, rails, um, just do anything they could really to discombobulate the German resupply and, and uh, reinforcement effort. And the way you communicated with them uh, was on the BBC World Service, which, by the way, if you got caught in France listening to the BBC World Service, it was an instant death penalty so, uh, by the German occupiers. So uh, this was a, a brave group of people. Uh, but they would listen for certain code words. And the code word that told the French resistance in that part of northern France that the evasion would happen within the next 24 hours was a line from an 1860-ish uh, poem, uh, Chasson de Tomb. I apologize to any French speakers. I read it, I translate it, I don't speak it. Um, Song of, of Autumn is what it was. And the line specifically was, wounds my heart with a monotonous languor. Wounds my heart with a monotonous languor. When the French resistance heard that line, over a whole series of just random lines of poetry, they knew time to mobilize, and they instantly went out and started uh, attacking um, rails, uh, railways, communications, blowing up telegraph poles, etc. cetera. Um, I want to mention the gliders, because the initial assaults were by primarily gliders, as well as the paratroopers. Uh, all airborne, but instead of jumping out of a perfectly good airplane, this is even worse. Imagine at night 
landing in a field and hoping to God you're not going to run into a barbed wire fence or maybe a cow. Uh, and a lot of casualties could be incurred with these hard landings. Uh, but there is the, uh, the Waco glider, which was primarily used by U.S. airborne troops. British troops used a thing called the Horsa. So I love this story. Of all the stories around D-Day, this is my favorite, so indulge me for a moment. The Pegasus Bridge. The Pegasus Bridge. Uh, there you see it. That was taken a day or two after. Um, you see Pegasus there. That was the, uh, the shoulder patch or the symbol of British Airborne. Um, this was uh, a bridge over the Khan Canal. And the reason why it had to be taken early is if you could control this bridge, then it would delay the Germans sending troops up from the Khan area up to the beach. So the very first target of the airborne troops was to take control of that bridge. And there, there you see them. And the task was given to B and D companies of the Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry, the Ox and Bucks, commanded by Major John Howard. Now, how many of you have seen the movie The Longest Day? Yeah, a lot of you. Okay, so now you gotta go home and watch it again to see this. When they portray this event at the Pegasus Bridge, uh, they take the bridge literally in 10 minutes. Uh, one of the most amazing things is those horse gliders, five of them landed within about 50 yards of the bridge. This is at night. Landed 50 yards. So the, the oxen bucks charged across the bridge, totally surprised the Germans, took control. But then, of course, there was the counterattack. Uh, and the very first casualty, or very first known Allied soldier killed was Lieutenant Den Brotheridge. Uh, he was leading an assault across the bridge and, and was killed. Um, but we think he was the very first Allied uh, killed in action. So Major John Howard, they're holding the bridge. His orders are, hold until relieved. Hold until relieved. And so in the movie, they did a brilliant job. They have uh, the, the actor playing Major Howard crouched down, bullets flying overhead, and he's thinking to himself, hold until relieved. Hold until relieved. And all of a sudden in the background, what do you think you hear? The bagpipes. It's the first special service brigade arriving to relieve them. Uh, what is even more interesting about this episode is the actor in that movie, which came out, I think, 61 or 62, the actor, Richard Todd, who was a very prominent British actor in the 60s and 50s, on that very day, 6 June 1944, he was Lieutenant Richard Todd, 7th Battalion, the Parachute Regiment. He arrived at the bridge about 1300. And I always thought, wow, the actor that played, not himself, but uh, another actor played him, to play Major Howard in that movie. Um, that I've always thought was fascinating. Well, there's more to this story. And I mentioned the first um, Special Service Brigade. It was um, special operators, basically, is what we call them today. Uh, they were made up of Royal Marine Commandos, some uh, Army Special Units, and some Free French Units. And they were commanded by this gentleman there. You see him right there. That is. Uh, Brigadier Simon Fraser, 15th Lord Lovett. He was the, the chief of Clan Fraser. So he's a Scotsman. Now, uh, their mission, they land at Sword Beach. They're to march inland and to the, to the bridge and relieve Major Howard, um, which in fact they did. But Piper Millen, there you see him there, John Millen, uh, he was from Canada. He was the personal piper. He was a member, a soldier in the unit, but he was the personal piper of Lord Lovett, chief of Clan Fraser. And before the assault, when Bill Millen said to Lord Lovett, now you can see from Lovett, he's very tall and thin, and so you can imagine what's gonna happen now. When Piper Millen said, but sir, the orders are no bagpipes to be played on the landing, no kilt to be worn. Lord Fraser looked down at him and said, aye, but those are English war office rules and you and I are Scots. So when the landing craft hit Sword Beach, the ramp came down, out came Piper Millen. 
not only piping, I think it was all the blue bonnets or all the border, for those of you who might know that, but he was wearing the kilt that his father, who was in the Cameron Highlanders, had worn in the trenches in the First World War. That kilt and the bagpipes are in a museum in Scotland, although Millen said that it re the, the pipes he actually played that day uh, were damaged, and so what's in the museum now is uh, his backup set. Um, there is a statue if you, if you get to go uh, to Normandy, as, by the way, I will be leaving in three days for Paris, doing lectures. Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, I could, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'll be doing some lectures there in southern England as well as uh, uh, in Normandy for this, the 80th anniversary of, uh, of uh, D-Day. And I, I hope that there will be some veterans, but you know, remember, they're all going to be pushing 100 or over, so there may or may not be, but that would certainly be an honor and a privilege if any of them are there. Uh, but there is a bronze statue of Piper Millen overlooking Sword Beach. And also, uh, the bridge there, um, they put a new bridge in in the 90s, but they built it just like the original. And then they took the, the original one, and it sits, there's a very nice museum there at the Pegasus Bridge. It sits there. So if you ever uh, get to go to Normandy, you've got to go see the Pegasus Bridge. Sorry that I just took a long way around, but I think the whole Pegasus Bridge thing with the ox and bucks and hold until relieved and the bagpipes coming over the hill, that, to me, is, is something special. Uh, but there were other um, airborne troops. There is Pathfinders. Um, the idea of a Pathfinder is these are the first to land, and they mark the landing zone. Uh, so there you see them portrayed as uh, uh, perhaps just before they embarked in their aircraft. Big problem, though. Uh, a lot of these pilots of these C-47s, or think DC-3 is a civilian corps, uh, equivalent, um, this was their first real in action. And so uh, oftentimes the paratroopers were dropped as much as 30 or 40 miles away from the drop zone. Several of them were shot down. So what you had all over, uh, not so much on the British side, but certainly with the 82nd and 101st, you literally had little groups of soldiers all over the countryside. That worked out because the Germans were so confused as to what was happening, little action here, little action there, over there, that they never could really organize a, a proper defense. We also dropped, we being the Allies, what were called Ruperts. And these were dummies about yay high, uh, rubber dummies that looked like a paratrooper, and they would have firecrackers, so when they hit the ground, these firecrackers would go off and, and make the Germans think, oh, there's an airborne assault here, when it really was over there. So that's the airborne troops. Prepare to hit the beach. There is Omaha Beach, and you, you get the idea, those heights. Here's why I said it was just an improbable place to land, because it was basically a curve, a long beach with 100 to 150 foot high cliff beyond. Uh, and the only way to get through was through various cuts or draws, and of course the Germans had that all ranged in and they could fire literally from this side and this side. Uh, so Omaha Beach actually went pretty badly. Um, there's a, uh, they're called the Bedford Boys, 29th uh, Infantry Division, 116th Regiment. Uh, they were from a little town in, in Virginia called Bedford, population a couple thousand. So these guys were all in that uh, Virginia National Guard, and it was federalized and became the 116th Regiment, uh, 29th Division. Within the first 10 minutes or thereabouts of the D-Day landing, 18 of them are killed. Now imagine 18 young men from one little village killed. They're called the Bedford Boys. And so appropriately enough, the National U.S. Uh, D-Day Memorial is in Bedford, Virginia. Uh, so it was, it was brutal. Um, Utah Beach, a little bit better. It was more of a flat area. And one thing that actually helped is because of the set and drift, um, the current, uh, a lot of these troops landed not at their actual landing zone. Turned out that was a less well-defended beach. 
So on the Utah beach, they were able to move in much quicker. Um, but in between Utah and Omaha Beach was that little promontory you see it there called Pont du Ho. And the Germans had placed, you can see there the circles, a number of large caliber guns that could bombard either Omaha or uh, Utah Beach. And so the second and fifth rangers, this was the origin of the modern rangers, they had to scale that cliff under fire. Uh, it turns out the guns were fake. The Germans had actually moved the guns more inland, but eventually they were silenced. But that's one of the famous episodes there, Juan de Hope, um, in, uh, in terms of neutralizing the German defenses. Land the landing force, that's what it looked like. One of the problems with, even though these great landing craft, when that thing comes down, you might jump in and the water's over your head. Uh, it just depends on the rivulets and, and how the, the sand has been shaped underneath. Ideally, you can run them right up on the beach, drop the ramp, and off you go. And if anybody's ever done this, as I have a couple of times, uh, the last time I did this, fully kitted out, water was up to here. Yeah. So you can only imagine what it was like for these guys as they came ashore. Land the landing force. Um, one of the things that, as the situation on Omaha Beach began to go very badly, uh, one of the things that saved it was the U.S. by God Navy. Here's how that happened. Uh, the problem with Omaha Beach is it's long and sloping. And again, the Germans could fire from many directions, and so it became just horrendous casualties. So the soldiers would basically find any cover they could, and the whole attack stalled. So much so that General Bradley, Omar Bradley, almost recalled the Omaha Beach. But what happened was two things. Uh, the deputy commander of the 29th Division, a fellow by the name of Brigadier General Norman Cota, if you saw the movie The Longest Day, Robert Mitchum played Norman Cota. Could not have gotten a better choice of an actor. He basically got up, chomping on his cigar, walking up and down the beach, totally impervious to enemy fire, and said, get your asses off this beach, or you're going to be dead or off this beach. And he essentially organized um, an assault on uh, one of these draws that I mentioned earlier, basically a, a gully. And they were eventually, by early afternoon, able to start driving the Germans out. A second thing is uh, basically destroy a squadron nine which was providing um, covering fire, uh, those skippers, a lot of them, without any orders, just simply said, we're going in. And there were a couple of destroyers that actually got uh, 800 yards or so off the beach and doing what we used to call naval gunfire support, NGFS. I think now it's called naval fires. Same thing. You're trying to spot a target on the beach uh, and put some rounds on it and neutralize it. Uh, and because these destroyers risked running aground or sinking or being taken under fire, they were able to neutralize enough of these German defensive positions such that the soldiers pinned down the beach on Omaha Beach could start getting up and onto the, the heights. Um, come to find out, um, USS Corey actually probably hit a mine, broke in half, and sank right off the beach. I didn't know this until my grandmother's funeral back in the 90s cousin of my mother's was wounded, a sailor on board the Cory. Uh, so a little bit of personal family connection there. Um, quite a number of hits. There was one comment that rifle fire from the beach was pinging off the superstructure of the ship. That's how close they were. Uh, General Giraud, who commanded that section of the beach, sent a message to General Bradley, thank God for the U.S. Navy. So that's what happened on Omaha. On the British beaches, it actually went a lot smoother. There are the, the various units involved, including the Free French Forces. Juneau Beach, as I mentioned, was the Canadian sword and gold. On Omaha, the situation stabilized uh, enough by mid-afternoon that they were able to begin sending in significant reinforcements. Uh, and now a lot of the Germans in fact, were not German. Poles, Czechs, Russians, 
they'd been more or less forced into enlisting in the German army. Um, so they weren't all that motivated uh, and they began surrendering in large numbers. So literally by the end of the day, uh, you had about 160,000 troops uh, landed on the beaches. There is Eisenhower's message, just in case it failed. Our landings in the Cherbourg, La Havre um, area failed to gain a uh, foothold, my decision to et cetera, et cetera. So he actually wrote that out. Uh, it says there July 5th, it was actually June 5th. Um, that's a famous message that he never had to send, fortunately. So let me, let me wrap up a little bit. Um, one of the key points here is you had to establish a port. And you see Cherbourg up there uh, on the peninsula there. One of the things that the Germans did, and they did it quite well, was literally destroy the whole harbor facility. Uh, it took several weeks uh, to actually restore it to, to operational use. Uh, but once the beach there at Utah, you see American beaches, once that was taken, then the Seventh uh, Corps essentially attacked and surrounded and forced to surrender to Cherbourg. So supply is going to be critical. And there were a couple of things that the Allies did to try to mitigate or improve the supply situation. Knowing that you had to get supplies over the beach, knowing that you only had X number of landing craft and ships available to bring supplies in, the mulberry. Uh, these things, individual, I see you've got a better picture there. The individual casements are known as Phoenix, and they manufactured these things out of concrete with hollowness there. And the idea was to sail them up, locate them where you wanted, open the shuttlecocks and boom, sink it, and then build on top of it roadways like that. Um, and the idea is that a ship can come upside the mulberry, offload, and then into the trucks and onto the beach. Now, in reality is a great idea. Not that many supplies were ever brought in. About two weeks after the initial landing, there was a huge storm, as can happen in the channel, and it literally destroyed one of these mulberries that was off uh, Omaha Beach. The, the British um, one was still in operation for a little bit longer, and by the way, uh, you can still see these things. Uh, off Ara, Aranache, I think is the town. You can still see these things because they're literally huge concrete things in the water. Once a lodgment was made, then you began to move in. And this got really complicated um, in terms of driving the Germans back because they had to fight in what was known as the Bocage country. Now the Bocage is literally farm fields, instead of being separated by maybe a stone fence, hedges, huge thick hedges, some of them medieval, hundreds of years old. And these were perfect locations for the Germans to set up tank trap ambushes or machine gun nests or what have you. Um, and so the fighting in the Bocage country for the next couple of months was pretty vicious. But ultimately, uh, the Allies were able to take Cherbourg, to take Saint-Lô, to take Caen, which were the major targets, and essentially expand the beachhead such that um, in July and August, they were able to trap a lot of Germans and drive them back. And on the 25th of August, the Allies marched into Paris. So Operation Overlord, highly successful. Now, that is a quick and dirty, uh, I could actually talk about this for hours and hours and hours, but then you would have to call me by my, my Roman name, Professor Boris Loquacious. Okay, um, Professor Jackson, uh, as we've said, uh, is going to take the questions, but let me real quick point something out here. Um, the danger of a lecturer taking questions. Now, see the portrait. I love to put these recruiting posters up from World War I, World War II, and there you see man the guns with this Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of guy, hefting looks like probably an eight-inch round uh, or something like that that no one could possibly lift. But I do a lot of lectures at uh, senior centers, retired uh, retirement centers. 
And I was doing one a few years ago in Hartford. And I got to the Q&A. And that came, was behind me. Very first question. Delightful lady in the first row who asked, what did you do in the war? <laughs> so I merely mouthed something like, oh, well, I, you know, I was not born until the 1950s, but my dad and uncle, you know. Had I been really on the ball, I would have pointed to that and said, yes, ma'am, I was the model for that recruiting poster. <laughs> With that, we'll take any questions. Thank you. Uh -huh. That's, that's absolutely terrific, and you know, so hard to compress everything that happened. And what we tend to forget is we knew this was going to win, that we were going to yep. win this. No, it was never guaranteed that it was going to succeed. It went, could have gone very badly and whatnot, but a lot of brave people, smart people and whatnot brought that together. So are there any questions here in the audience? Sir. Be sure to, yeah, there we go, use the, uh, the microphone so we can all hear. Uh, Professor Carpenter, very interesting brief. I appreciated everything, very informative. Uh, I too have a family connection to D-Day as my father was on a troop transport uh, that actually went in to you know, drop off the troops uh, that hit a mine and sank off mm -hmm. Juneau Beach. So I do have a family connection as you mentioned. The question that I always, I always had is, there were five beachheads right. hit. Did we have any intelligence that said, this beachhead is gonna be very bad, this beachhead will not be so bad? Did we know which yeah, couple, ones were better couple, than others? Right, couple thoughts on that. In terms of just the physical nature of the beaches, you, you learned very quickly in the Pacific with the attack on Tarawa uh, in, uh, what was it, November of 43, you better do a beach survey. You better know what the grade is, if there are any obstructions, uh, what the type of sand or, or what have you is. Will it support um, uh, craft or tanks or what have you? So one of the things that came out of that Pacific experience was the creation of the UDTs, the frogmen. Uh, now, they did not use scuba tanks, even though it had been invented by Jacques Cousteau earlier. Uh, they would swim in with the fins, hence frogmen, uh, with a mask and snorkel. And they would go in and, and at night examine the beach. So we had a pretty good idea of what the beach conditions were. There was a failure of intelligence in this sense. The 352nd Infantry uh, Division of the German Army, the Allied intelligence people thought that they were in no further towards the beaches than the, the town of San Lo, which is about 20 miles inland. In point of fact, they were right there on Omaha Beach. So that's another explanation for why that was going so badly. Did not expect that many German defenders there. I think the only saving grace there might have been a lot of those guys were, as I mentioned earlier, Czechs, Poles, um, Russians that had been conscripted into the, the Wehrmacht, and they were pretty eager to to surrender, uh, but an entire uh, division was on the beach at Omaha that we did not expect. So a lot of good intelligence was collected by folks like the UDT, the Frogmen, uh, who by the way, uh, the, were the precursors of the Navy SEALs. Um, uh, but there was a huge intelligence failure. Another problem that we had was in order not to um, alert the Germans that the attack's coming, the pre-bombardment, the naval bombardment, only lasted about half an hour. Uh, at the same time, the aircraft are coming over, dropping bombs, but they didn't want to drop any big ones, not the 500,000 pounds, so it was 100 and 200 pound bombs, which would just literally bounce off the concrete um, sort of things. They should have anticipated that. 100 pound bomb is not going to do much damage to a concrete bunker. So that also complicated the the, uh, the Omaha Beach. And what was happening is these airplanes would come in and they were so worried about dropping bombs on landing craft coming in that they delayed anywhere between five and 20 seconds to drop. Well, as fast as an aircraft goes, by the time they dropped the bombs, they all hit inland. So literally the German defenses on Omaha Beach were completely intact. You could say that maybe was an intelligence failure to brief the, the guys and saying, hey, you need to drop these right on time or you're gonna miss. 
and, and a, a complication with both the naval bombardment, which tended to go long as well, uh, was the smoke from this concentrated activity. Um, all sorts of smoke obscured the beaches plus morning fog. And so these guys were shooting blind. Uh, shooting ashore or bombardment ashore was really only effective once Desron 9 guys went in and were doing call for fire or they could see a gun flash from a specific target and then lay a five inch round on it. But the pre-bombardment, uh, I would say a failure of intelligence to fully brief uh, exactly where you should be shooting. Thank you, sir. All right. Is that it? That's it. That's Appreciate it. it. Thank you very much. As I say, it's an honor and a pleasure. And um, I just, one last thing here. If you're interested in this subject, I would recommend two books most highly. Um, Cornelius Ryan's The Longest Day, that's where the movie got its uh, name from, and more recently, Rick Atkinson's Liberation Trilogy. Uh, volume three of that trilogy concerns uh, D-Day and, of course, the March to the Rhine. So I uh, highly recommend those books. Thank you very much. It's been an honor and a pleasure. And let me also mention that one of the finest museums is a little uh, uh, gym that's in Wakefield, Rhode Island. It's the World War II Foundation Museum. And it's absolutely incredible, the items that they have in there, including a Rupert uh, that they had dumped out through uh, with the aircraft and whatnot. But uh, it's really worth the doing, particularly on the anniversary. Uh, quick question, Matt Ellsworth, are you in the room? As we close the session, uh, I'd like to note that World War II was a time when relationships and letters from home meant so much to the fighting forces. It's my pleasure to recognize a loving relationship between two folks in our audience, certainly not World War II era, but I'd like to ask Matt and Karen Ellsworth to please stand and be recognized on which anniversary? 14th anniversary, congratulations. Well, that's it for tonight. Uh, thanks for coming, and we look forward to seeing you all in the fall when we kick off the uh, Issues in National Security Lecture for the next academic year. Thank you.